Hi, I'm Stephen Apt, and here at Divine Savior Church, we believe that the message of Jesus truly changes lives. And so it's my prayer that as you listen to this message, that it does change your heart, uh, that it brings you peace and hope once again today. After you listen to it, if you wouldn't mind subscribing and liking, uh, we'd be grateful for that so that more people can hear the message of Jesus. Thank you. No greater hope. That's the series that we're in here after Easter as we see how the resurrection of Jesus gives us hope. And what we want to do is grow in that hope, know that hope, grow in that hope, and live in that hope every day. And so as we come to our second week in this series, the question I have for you today is, what is one thing that needs to change in this world? If you could pray for anything to change in the world, what would it be? What is one thing that you need that you pray that God changes it? What is it, the, the one thing that you think your family and your kids need, that if God just changed that? This morning, we're going to hear that every single answer is the same one. That's what Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 1. Paul wants us to know greater hope. And that's what he talks about at the bottom, the second half of Ephesians chapter 1 today. In his letter that he wrote from prison in 60 AD, Paul wrote to uh, the Christians living in Ephesus, uh, whom he knew well. He spent two and a half years there, uh, starting the church, building the church, teaching the people about Jesus in Ephesus. And after two and a half years, he left to go spread the gospel elsewhere. And as he did so, he was arrested and put in prison for preaching the gospel. And it's from his dungeon, his prison, that he writes to the Ephesians. And as we said last week, it's not a letter of doom and gloom. It's not a letter of despair. Instead, it's a letter filled with all kinds of hope that can only come from Jesus. And so that's what we're doing over the next several weeks. Uh, We are walking through the book of Ephesians, and we're going to cover every single verse to see how you and I have greater hope. Today, we're in chapter 15, and here's Paul's prayer. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. It's really not that many verses, and yet it's jam-packed with just incredible truths for you and me. Uh, Just Paul starts right away. Ever since I heard about your faith in Jesus, the vertical, and your love for all God's people. It's the vertical relationship with Jesus. Knowing the love that our Jesus has for us that inspires and motivates love for other people. And not just the the feeling of love, but agape love. Unconditional and undeserved love for other people. Paul says, ever since I heard about this, I haven't stopped giving thanks for you. Remembering you in my prayers. And then he says, but here's what I keep asking. I keep asking that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation to know him better. Think about that for a second. 
How long did Paul spend with these people? Two and a half years. Building them up in Jesus. Building them up in God's word. Showing them who God is. For two and a half years, he made sure that there were elders in place to continue to teach the people. And yet, what's Paul's prayer? I'm asking that God gives you his spirit more. His spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. He doesn't say, you know God, I know you know God, and so what I've been praying for is your marriage problems. What I've been praying for is the persecution you're going through. I, I, I've been praying for your economic, economic hardship and that God would, would bring you prosperity. I've been praying that, that he solves your hunger problems. No. I pray that no matter what's going on, I keep asking that God helps you know him better. It's an incredible prayer. What kind of knowledge is Paul talking about? There's head knowledge and and then there's heart knowledge, and what Paul wants is for those two to collide together, right? There's head knowledge. I know a lot about God. I know a lot of facts. I can spit out the stories to you. I can spit out characteristics of God. And then there's heart knowledge that trusts it. Do you know who has a lot of head knowledge about God? A lot of facts about God? The demons. Satan. James chapter 2, James says, you believe that there's one God. Good. Even the demons know that and they shudder. Isn't it interesting that the demons know that there's only one God? Where our world believes in all kinds of different gods, the demons know there's one God. They know it, and it terrifies them. That's head knowledge about God. What Paul's asking is that the Spirit come, the Holy Spirit come and give us wisdom and revelation about who God is so that we know him better. Not only facts, but trust. God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. What does that mean for me? And, And trust it. Know him better better. This is the prayer that Paul has for the Christians in Ephesus and for you and me. What do you and I need? It's your first point today. To know God better. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't pray for all those other things. There are other times in the Bible that, that God invites us to pray for those things. He wants us to pray for those things. But what's the number one thing that we need? The spirit of wisdom and revelation that we know God better. In other words, there's no graduation from God. We've got this uh, starting point class. It's 10 weeks to, to get to know God, what he's done for us, what he is doing for us, and what he will continue to do for us. Uh, it's starting point. There's no graduation. It's not like, oh, I finished a class I'm good. No. We need to know God better. And how do we do that? We open up the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit works through the Word of God to help us to mind the depths of God and know Him better. And you know the crazy thing is? The God of this world the God of this world who created everything, wants you to know him better. He wants to be known by you. It's why he gave us his word in the first place, so that you may know him better. The question is, do you? Do we want to know God better? I think probably for all of us, the answer is, well, yes. But now here comes a really tough part. Does our confession match our action? Is what our confession that we say matching up with what we do? Because it's easy for you and me to sit here and say out loud, yes, I want to get to know God better. It's easy to think, yes, I want to know God better. But 
is what we're saying matching up with our actions. How often do you open up the Word of God? Is it just on Sunday morning? And if it's just on Sunday morning, are you here every Sunday so that you're at least getting to know God a little bit better on Sunday morning, one day a week, for an hour? When was the last time you joined a connect group or a Bible study or starting point? When was the last time you opened up the Word of God at your home to get to know God better personally? Does our confession match our actions. If not, it's not because we don't like to learn things, right? We love to know things. My guess is all of you love your career. And what do you do? You study your career. You continue to learn about your career because it makes you better at what you do. Some of you have a hobby that you enjoy and that you, you learn about, you grow in, because it's a joy to do it. Some of you, like me, could read hours and hours of articles on your favorite sports teams and never be bored. And you just take that information in because I love to know it. Others of you love to get together with friends to get to know them better. A big thing right now is, uh, for the last couple of years, is date your spouse. Why? So that you continue to know them. So that it, one day you don't wake up and you sit across from them and say, I don't even know the person I'm si sitting across from anymore. We love to know things. We love to know people. But are we getting to know God better? Paul says, what is our biggest need? It doesn't matter if you've been believing in God for a month or for 90 years. Paul says, I keep asking that God give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation to know him better. Why do so many people struggle with anxiety? There's several reasons. But one of the reasons is because we've settled for a, a very shallow knowledge of our God. And we fail to realize and to get to know him better that our God is a loving God who's on his throne, who's in control of every situation you're in. And that, yes, the situation's out of your control, but it's never out of our God's, who loves you, who gave his son for you. What if we got to know that God better? Some of you struggle with contentment. And why do we struggle with contentment? Because we fail to realize that we have a God who, who says, I've given you everything you need, in every situation, so that you can abound in every good work. This is the God we have. Some of us are overcome with guilt, overcome with shame. And why can't we shake it? Because we're looking everywhere else instead of getting to know the heart of our God and the depths of his mercy for you and me. What if we got to know God better? Imagine what it would do to the situation that you're in. Imagine how things would change without anything ever changing. The situation doesn't have to change for our heart and our minds to change as we get to know our God better. We keep asking that God would send his spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we know God better. This is what Paul says to the Ephesians. And this is what he says to you and me. Let's get to know God better. And as we open up that word, and the Spirit gives us the wisdom and revelation to know him better, what else is going to happen? Well, Paul says in verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Uh, you can't really see it in this English translation, um, but in the Greek, all three of those are separate clauses. The hope to which he's called you, the glorious inheritance of his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. 
It's marked off by the Greek word T or tis, which means what. So what hope you've been called to, what the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and what incomparably great power for us who believe. As we open up God's word and the spirit reveals to us reveals to our hearts our God and we get to know him better, what are we going to see? First, the hope to which God's calling is. Here's the second point. No greater hope. We will get to know the hope of God's calling. The hope of God's calling. Uh, the English says, uh, the hope to which he has called you. It, it's not the season of life we're in. It's not what we're doing right now. That's the hope that he's called us to. It's God's calling. And what's God's calling? 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says that God has called us to fellowship with Jesus Christ. To, to have unity with Jesus Christ. It's God's salvation. It's the calling of God's salvation that he's called you to. He's called you to eternal life. He's called you to the forgiveness of sins. He's called you to righteousness. Not to be righteous, but, or not so that you can be righteous, but so that you are righteous through Jesus. He's called you to the hope of knowing that one day you'll have an incorruptible body as you rise from the dead. This is God's calling to you. Unity with Jesus Christ. And it's yours through him. And it's a certainty through our God. There's a, a I heard a preacher once say uh, that he was talking to a group of people who, who were doubting whether they were saved, doubting their faith. And the preacher said, here's what you need to do if you are doubting. You need to go outside today Look up to heaven and say, Father, I give my life to you and I'm claiming my salvation today. And then drive a stake into the ground where you did it. And then if you're ever doubting, come back and look at that stake and know that your salvation is yours. It sounds good, doesn't it? But I've never done that. I never will do that. And I pray you don't do that either. Because you know what I know is going to happen to me? I'm going to leave that stake, and not even 10 minutes when I, before I get home, I'm going to sin in some way. Whether it's a prideful thought. Whether it's a judgmental thought. Lustful thought. Maybe it's I've lost patience with my kids. I'm going to sin in some way, and then I'm going to come back and look at that stake, and I'm going to say, did I really mean it? There's no hope when I have my eyes looking at myself. There's no hope when I, I claim something for myself because my heart is so fickle. Instead, where's the hope? It's not in a stake that I drove through the ground. It's in the stake that Jesus was crucified to. It's in the stake that our God says it's through this merit, Jesus' merit, his work, his forgiveness, that this is yours. This is my calling to you, and it's yours through Jesus Christ. That is where certainty comes from, and that's the hope of God's calling, and it's yours. And it doesn't matter what situation you're in. It doesn't matter if you have failed miserably or if you're in extreme success. This is your hope of God's calling, and it's a certainty because of Christ. This is what he's called you to. No matter what you're going through, it's yours. The second phrase, we will know... Know your value. As we get to know God better, we're going to see the hope to which he's called us, and we're going to see our value. Where does that come from? The second phrase that Paul says is to uh, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. We know what an inheritance is. It's something that's passed down from one generation to the next. And in Paul's day, uh, this is how people really made their wealth. Uh, this is how they became important. Son worked for dad, for dad's business, and he was taken care of. 
But son didn't become wealthy until dad died and business became his and all of dad's wealth became his. And then he had everything. That's what an inheritance is. And normally as we read scripture, uh, scripture a lot of times talks about our inheritance being God's kingdom. Our inheritance being heaven with God. And that's true. But that's not what this says. It's God's inheritance in his holy people. What could God possibly inherit that he doesn't already have? A few years ago, Elon Musk moved Tesla to to Austin. And uh, he's one of the, the wealthiest people in the world, if not the wealthiest, at least at the time. Could you imagine being his son or daughter and try to give him a gift at Christmas? What could you possibly give Elon Musk that he doesn't already have, that that would completely wow him and say, I've always wanted this. I don't know. What could God possibly not have that he, when he finally gets it, he says, I've never had this. And is completely wowed. You. His glorious inheritance in his holy people. At the end of time, There is a twofold inheritance. You inherit God's kingdom, and God inherits you. You talk about value. His glorious inheritance in his holy people. That's how much he values you. You, We sang earlier, uh, and you are my all in all, seeking you as a precious jewel, as God's our precious jewel. But the same is true for you, for God. You are his precious jewel that he won and bought with his son, forgiven you, made you holy and blameless in his sight, and now he values you. And you are his inheritance that he is wowed by. That doesn't change based on the situation or circumstances that you're in. What would happen if we grew deeper in that knowledge? What would our lives look like if we grew deeper in knowing our value to God? Finally, your last one. Know his power. Know his power. His his incomparably great power for us who believe. It's the same power that was used to raise Jesus from the dead. Why the same power that raised Jesus from the dead? We know what power is, right? Just a few days ago, uh, I think it was Wednesday night and Thursday, Thursday and Friday, something like that, those powerful tornadoes that went through, uh, especially Oklahoma, and just devastated towns. Schools are gone, homes are gone. We know what power is. We know the power of a hurricane. We know the power of nature. Why didn't Paul say, according to that power? Because there's no greater power in this world, no greater force than death. There's just not. And God has power over it. Jesus, who died, God rose from the dead, glorified him, put him on the throne in heaven, and now what's he doing? He is ruling with that power for his people, for his body, his church, and that includes you. No matter what you're going through, Our God has power over the situation and he uses it for the good of those who love him, for you, for his church. What if we got to know that power better? What if we got to know this hope better? What if we got to know your value to your God better? Suddenly things change without even changing. Suddenly the thing I need may not be I need to escape this situation, but I need to get to know my God better because then I get to see things completely differently. Suddenly, a a dungy prison that Paul's in is no longer a place of despair. It turns into an opportunity for evangelism as he gets to talk to the guards. Suddenly, your situation changes where setbacks are, are not failures. They're not moments to despair, but they're opportunities to see God's grace, to see God's power. Suddenly, everything changes 
as it's no longer woe is me, but now I get to know God better. I get to see his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, his power, his hope for us who believe. And so this week, let's pray. Here's your challenge. Every day, wake up and pray. Give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation, God, that I may know you better. And fill me with the hope that is you. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you uh, that you want us to know you better. We thank you that uh, you send your spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we get to know you better as we open your word and we get to hear from you and we get to hear what's on your heart. We get to not only learn facts about you, which is true, uh, but then we, uh, through the spirit's help, it plants in our hearts. And the Holy Spirit works faith and trust in you as our God. Help us to continue to know you better. Uh, Continue to send that spirit so that we may know you deeper. Because all of us have things that are going on in our life. All all of us have things that we wish would change. Uh, And yet, we know that you are using all those things so we get to know our God better. The God who loves us, who's merciful, compassionate. We get to know the hope for which you've called us better. We get to know our value to you. We get to know your power that's at work in our lives. And so help us to pray this prayer every day so that we grow in the hope that is Jesus Christ, the resurrection of the dead, the life eternal, your calling. We ask you to be with us and help us to grow in this this week. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for listening to this message today. It's my prayer that uh, it has changed your heart as you grew in the message of your Savior, Jesus. Again, if you wouldn't mind liking and subscribing, we'd be grateful for that. God bless your day.